Hi, welcome to Ask a VC, where we put VCs in the hot seat. We're joined today by Ben Fu, partner at Next World Capital. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I want to go into a little bit of your bio. Um, at Next World Capital, you've invested in Datamir, Datastax, and Good Data. A lot of data is in there. Um, and you, uh, prior to joining Next World Capital, you were a principal at Scale Venture Partners, where you helped originate the firm's investments in Box and Utest. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, I want to go into the Next World Capital story and additive. And um, I know that you have a special program that basically helps companies expand into Europe, which is it's a pretty unique sort of program. Tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. Uh, Nextual Capital, we got started in 2009, made our first investment in uh, 2010, uh, and we're an expansion stage international uh, venture capital firm where we focus on uh, enterprise software, uh, mobile, and consumer internet. Um, to your point, uh, we have a very unique program, which I think is uh, one of a kind, where we help our companies be able to expand into Europe um, on multiple facets. We call it the uh, European Expansion Program. Uh, we actually have a dedicated venture partner out there uh, who is able to help our companies expand strategically as well as tactically with a network of about 100 uh, C-level and EVP-level folks out there. Yeah, so tell me about why having someone helping that particular uh, expansion is, is, a, is a value add for, you know, let's say, a data mirror, a data sacks, or a good data. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it can be incredibly valuable um, at the right phase of the company's life. Um, since we focus on expansion stage, where we look for companies that have product market fit and are looking to uh, help, we're, we're looking to help with anything expansion domestically and internationally. We, it can be it can be very helpful to uh, bring our companies there to make the right introductions, uh, to be able to find the right partners, and actually you know uh, create new business. So um, it's it's something where you know at least from our perspective, it's a third of the world's GDP. Yeah. And if you look at any enterprise software company early or mature, it's anywhere between 10 and 30 percent of their business. It's interesting because I was talking to someone and another investor recently, and. And the, the sort of thought was that it used to be that companies would wait to go public and then they would expand internationally. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's happening well before um, you know any companies go public. They're already getting international customers, have, have offices out um, in Europe and Asia. Why is that happening? Like, is that just a, a sign of like sort of the network expanding? Yeah, I think you know it's uh, one of the. One uh, way that some people say it is the world is flatter, and in particular for enterprise software, you know the accessibility to to try software, get knowledge about software, and really use it in the uh, the IT departments, you know, domestically or internationally. The the, the folks around the world are. Uh, get access to these uh, to the technologies sooner rather than later. Y you would say that you know Europe would always be about two or three years behind. I think the gap is actually getting closed um, uh, between the Europe and and the U.S. And you know, for us, we actually see it as companies need to buy uh, com startup companies need to be able to expand into Europe sooner uh, than they have before in the past. I want to switch topics over to your particular investment area. You tend to invest in a lot of quote unquote big data startups. We, we know that's a buzzword, I, I would say, at this point. Yep. But how do we do, where, where's the next um, discussion point beyond just saying now we have these big data companies that are very important, they're getting funding, they're gaining traction. Where is sort of the next uh, conversation going to be taking place? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, big data is, is being used and thrown around so much that it's hard to find what it is. Um, where we focus on in terms of big data, I think of it in the framework of uh, big data infrastructure, analytics, and then applications, if you think about the stack. Um, we've made an investment on the infrastructure side um, with uh, data stacks and then analytics and data mirror. Why I think it's, you know, what's, what's next, what's, in, what's interesting about it? You know, I think that we, we all know that there's a big problem, but to give you the magnitude of how big this problem really is, is uh, Hadoop will replatform uh, the enterprise data warehouse market, which is 10 billion per year. 
Um, you'll see NoSQL and uh, big data analytics be replatforming a lot of the incumbents, which is uh, in the database SQL uh, SQL world, which is twenty to thirty billion as well. So it's such a These huge, are huge problem. huge markets. Absolutely huge market. And you know, one thing that we hear from our uh, from our uh, startups customers is that that wording of replatforming, and it's it's huge markets where the entire stack will be shifted either to uh, new products by the incumbents, but more likely startups that will be able to capitalize on Hadoop, NoSQL, the an analytics layer that will, will go on top, as well as new applications we haven't even seen yet. How are, how's the spending changing when it comes to these you know, enterprise customers? The spending is actually quite interesting. You know, when in, uh, we always try to check this with our our uh, our, our portfolio companies. You know, what are customers actually saying? And you know, one of the most salient points we've heard is uh, some very large Fortune 50 retailers and uh, very top, I would say, top five uh, banks. We've heard the exact words of we're trying to figure out how not to spend a dollar more on our existing data warehouse and spending that exact same dollar or two dollars into Hadoop. And that you will see a big shift in dollar spend, which will be over the next five or ten years. It doesn't happen in just one year, one or two years. You'll continue seeing that happen over time where if I was an incumbent like a Oracle or Teradata, I'd be a bit worried. How big is the Hadoop opportunity? I mean, like you're seeing all these companies now leverage Hadoop and, and sort of be able to, to use Hadoop, allow businesses to use Hadoop. How big is that opportunity? How many companies are going to be using Hadoop? I, I actually think it will be the same market of enterprise data warehousing, you know, Natiza's market number of customers, Teradata's number of customers, you know, we're talking in the thousands, um, but very much on the high enterprise level. Um, and, you know, it, it's again, you know, $10 billion of annual spend in, in enterprise data warehousing. But the fact that it's free, and the technology is getting better and better, you will see companies that even on the small medium enterprise range and maybe even small businesses in the future will be leveraging it as well. Well, I want to talk about one of our, uh, talk uh, to mention one of our reader questions, which is around recruiting. And I'm assuming that as a VC, you're helping a lot of your portfolio with that. Um, the question was really around how, you know, how do you manage recruiting as an, er an early stage, you know, seed, series A, um, whether that be an engineer or a designer. And I'm really curious your perspective from the enterprise side of things mm -hmm. where, you know, you don't necessarily have the flashy, like, you know, hot rising startup in the consumer space, the secret of the world. It's not like that. You know, you're building an enterprise company, which is just, you know, sexy in its own right. So how do you advise companies on recruiting and what are best practices? Yeah, I, I think that recruiting, you know, it's, it's multidimensional in that for the different phases of the company's life, you need to hire the right key people. Uh, you know, in, with respect to like a series seed or series A, you want to make sure that you have a very strong technical team and technical uh, product team, you know, product and technical side, because that's really the heart or the engine and the future architecture of the company. You know, you, uh, you later in life you'll need to figure out biz dev and sales and marketing, even though that that gap again, you know, seems to be uh, shorter and shorter because you can get products to market quickly. But I would say that you know, focusing on recruiting really early really matters a lot. And, you know, I think a lot of Folks know that, but it's you know getting the right technical team in place and then sales later uh, is something that um, uh, you, you know you have to watch for at the right time. How long do you advise a CEO to spend with a potential candidate? You know, from like start that initial cold call or email or introduction to you know closing. Well, I think it depends on the level of the person. Um, obviously, the ones that are executives or you know the folks that you think will be the core of the team, uh, we should spend a lot of time. You know, I think that um, hiring process is a funnel, um, but you know, getting the right people can make a world of difference for the the company's outcome. And you know, getting to know, particularly for executives or VP hires, uh, getting to know that person's background, doing background checks, uh, you know, seeing if they can really uh, be additive to the chemistry of the team and be compatible really, really matters. And I think those are often underestimated because you think of somebody as a productive, you know, productivity output, input output, um, but there's a lot of other things that go along with you know, the intangibles, if you will, which makes the company 
uh, hum like a machine, if you will. Great advice. Thank you so much, Ben, for joining us.